I'm Thomas Reardon, a professor in the Department of Agricultural Food and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. And today I have the extreme pleasure and honor of giving a special lecture to the 26th Annual Conference of the Agricultural Economics Research Association of India, today on November 16th, 2018. My talk will focus on the very rapid transformation of Asian food systems and I'll draw from that some implications from farmers. And what I've been realizing in my life recently as I've got older and I've looked back over, t over time at my work in Asia and in other regions of the world in the past 25, 30 years, I realize how deeply and quickly the food systems that I've been studying over that time have changed. And the first time that I came to India in 1984, I was basically observing what I think is mainly a traditional food system. Uh, and then going and starting to work in Southeast Asia and in China, uh, and also again in India from the early 2000s to now, I've observed a very rapid change in food systems and believe that those deep changes have big implications for how we study and understand uh, what conditions farmers face and what strategies behoove them. So in this talk today, I'll talk about the immense transformation that's occurred in agri-food supply chains, which I think of as the food system, from the 1980s to now, taking as a reference point the 1980s, and look at a rapid confluence of factors that change the markets that farmers face. And I just love that term, confluence, from Latin, con, together, and flu, for flow, it's the idea of many rivers flowing together, and when several rivers join together, the power and the f rapidity of the water and the volume of the water is so much more. And so it's really the, the coming together of various forces that have hyper-accelerated food system change in Asia. And this has included deep changes in policies that have occurred, rapid urbanization, a huge change in urban and rural diets, and a modern revolution coupled with a quiet revolution in the off-farm parts of the food supply chains that I'll focus on in the talk today, uh, which I'll call the food system. And I think all of these spell big opportunities and challenges for farmers. The key image that I want you to have listening to this is that rather than change being gradual and slowly rolling out over time, it's been more like a tidal wave. And a tidal wave in mid-ocean is just a couple inches tall, and maybe for a thousand miles it's rolling six inches tall. But as the underlying forces come near the continental shelf, the wave surges up maybe to 50 feet tall and comes in. And that's essentially the image that we have of the food system changes over the past uh, 20, 30 years starting gradually in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and then building up in a surge of change really very recently. And I think uh, because of this, there's been a somewhat underemphasis on understanding food systems and their relationship uh, to the farm economy in the past 10, 20 years because a lot of the change has been very recent. Now when we look back and think again about this confluence of factors that are transforming the food systems, we can think first about the meta drivers. Uh, and throughout the Asian region, in various ways, sometimes more, sometimes less per country, but overall there's been a liberalization and privatization of the food economy in the region. Uh, I think I calculated that altogether the direct intervention in terms of sales of, of food in the Indian economy done by the government is only 7% of the total food economy of the country. Uh, the rest is all private sector. So that, in some sense, there's been a, a deep privatization even in situations where there's been a continued public distribution system. And of course, there's been a lot of infrastructure investment throughout Asia in various degrees. There's also been, and I think far, far more important and larger than government investments, have been massive private investments. This has been you know, the high-profile foreign direct investments, 
but it's also been domestic investments, and not just by uh, the big companies, but I think even far greater than the, the big companies, the investments aggregated of tens of thousands of small and medium enterprises that have deeply affected the uh, food system. So massive private investment. And then, at the same time, there's been rapid technological change. A lot of focus these days is on uh, the sexiest, newest technological changes like the emergence of robots and drones and CRISPR and uh, biotechnology, etc. But I think that a lot of the basic technological change that's been happening in the food system in Asia has been, has been shift, let's say, toward use of inputs uh, from capture fisheries to enclosed pond aquaculture. These sorts of basic technological changes have been the mainstay of the revolution that's occurred. And also there's been cross-cutting changes that are beginning to have their impact on the whole system, like the rise of internet and mobile phones and mobile payments, etc., that is emerging as a technological influence. And finally, of course, throughout the whole region, there's been substantial income growth. So these have been meta-drivers. Um, then in the food system itself, you can think of it as a train pulled uh, by the head of the train is the downstream part of the food system. Uh, the consumers that are in urban areas and in rural areas, so there's been rapid urbanization that's had an influence on the entire system. And then also at the same time, downstream, there's been fundamental diet change in both urban and rural areas. And then the train is moving along, facilitated by system changes in midstream and downstream. And this includes the transformation of the processing sector, the wholesale sector, the logistics sector, often a very understudied sector. And this has not just been the rise of the big corporates, which might be 10 or 20% of this whole story, maybe 30%. It's also very substantially, maybe 60, 70% of the whole story, is the rise and uh, proliferation and investment of small and medium enterprises throughout Asia. And of course, at the same time, down downstream there's been a supermarket revolution, a fast food revolution that's sweeping through Asia at various points in different countries but on average changing very quickly. And one thing that really struck me when I spent four years living in Delhi uh, was in studying some of these changes that were occurring in the food system from 2007 to 2011 is people would always say to me, uh, don't you feel that India is behind uh, what, where the United States is, and uh, in terms of the chain, these sorts of transformations of the food system. And my feeling, both in India and in Southeast Asia, where I also spent a lot of time, is that the big difference between Asia and the United States is not the kinds of changes that are occurring. In fact, as I'm studying the United States more, I actually started studying the United States after I studied Asia. Uh, and I began seeing the history of transformation of the food system, I found very little difference between what is happening in Asia, even starting from the same traditional food systems as in the United States, uh, and, and what's happened in the United States. The only difference is that in Asia, the changes are happening five or ten times faster than they did in the United States. That, to me, is the fundamental difference. Um, and, of course, this change in the midstream and the downstream are fed by upstream changes that have received the lion's share of analysis of farming intensification, commercialization, diversification beyond grains, and input value chain development. Maybe a little bit less research on input value chain development, so I'll come to that more at the end. And I'll leave the farming part out of the talk in terms of changes that are occurring in the farming part, um, except for implications. Now, if we look at, uh, we return now to the downstream and think about urbanization, let's turn back the clock uh, to when I was first in India in the 1980s. In Asia in general, the food system and the, and the economies were mainly rural. Urban was just a niche subject at that time. Uh, and in fact, the share of the population in, rural er in urban areas was only about 24% overall in Asia in 1971. And you see that over time, that share has gone up enormously to 45% on average. And another thing is that often people think that a lot of farmers are 
very far from the influence of towns and of cities, that there's many, many farmers living in hinterland areas. But in fact, recent studies have shown that only 4% of farmers are now living far away from towns where the town, mar the, and town and market influence is not substantial for them. So things have deeply changed with the rise of cities. But the population share actually understates the importance of urban areas for the total food consumed in Asia. If you look at this, these are the figures. The first figure, first is for South Asia and Southeast Asia. The first figure is the sh share on average, an approximation of uh, the urban areas in total population. Okay, so 30% and 40%. And then we did calculations of the share of urban consumption in total consumption in the country. And that's 40% in South Asia and 50% in Southeast Asia. And then we looked at the share of cities in the total purchases of food in the countries using LSMS data to make these calculations. And we found that about 50 to 60% of the total uh, purchase market of food uh, in South Asia and 60 to 70% in Southeast Asia is from cities. So overall, the situation has changed so fundamentally that now urban areas have the lion's share of consumption as well as the market in the countries. Just as a side note, I would say that if you compare this to exports, for example, which might have five or at most 10% of any Asian country's food system, uh, urban market is now maybe 10 times more important or 15 times more important uh, than exports. So that's why I'm thinking a lot about what's happening with the transformation of the rural urban supply chains. Urban market has become the main market uh, faced by farmers. Um, and of course, with the rise of the of urban market, this induces a giant river of food coming uh, through the farm, uh, food systems to the cities and towns. If you just look at Southeast Asia, over three decades, there's been a thousand percent increase in the volume of food flowing from rural areas to urban areas. So this is a, such a fundamental change. And also, the, uh, with the urbanization, of course, you need to stretch your arms further and further into rural areas to feed the cities. Uh, and so deeper and deeper uh, into rural areas go the impacts of urbanization. And we've seen, for example, in our detailed surveys uh, that, that we did in India, uh, the talk is based on a lot of surveys in India, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Bangladesh especially. Uh, we found, for example, that the impact of Delhi on Uttar Pradesh was very, very strong uh, in the nearby areas, uh, which you could call the new India in terms of the food system change. Very uh, deep transformation. Then in the middle areas, there's a rapid early takeoff of transformation, which you could call an emerging new India in terms of the food system. And then the pretty far from the main city's effects, there's still some characteristics in the survey of uh, from the hinterland of a still traditional food system that's, that persists. And a lot of times when people talk about what is the food system like, for example, uh, a very high share of tied output credit markets, which you'll see in a minute we found have largely disappeared based on the data. Uh, often the situation that they're citing is the remaining hinterland areas that are less influenced by urbanization. Secondly, downstream, there's been a fundamental change in diets. If I look back again to my reference point of the 1980s, at that time, both in the way agriculture economists thought and the reality is that farmers grow what they eat and eat what they grow. They're largely subsistence, or maybe they buy just a little bit with a very little, small reliance on food market. Uh, and at that time, of course, Rural and urban diets were nearly only grains, 80% grains, a little bit of vegetable. Um, and non-cereal like meat and fish and fruit and vegetables and dairy were really niche subjects in agricultural economics and in the overall debate. And at the same time, back in these days, consumers bought, bought very little processed food. Our detailed work on a number of data sets in Asia has shown that this situation has fundamentally changed. For example, the, 
there's been a rise of purchased food in total rural food expenditures. If you look at this in terms of the, the base, the total expenditures are purchased plus own production uh, in rural areas. And the purchase share in Indonesia and Bangladesh is about 80%. 80% of rural households' food is coming from purchases in value terms. And in Nepal, much poorer, and in Vietnam, a little bit richer, it varies from 65 to 72 percent. So uh, rural households have come to be very much engaged in the market as purchasers, uh, buying the food based on their sales of rural non-farm employment uh, labor, of sales of food, and um, you know, sales to, to some extent of agricultural wage labor. Also, the fact that you have this rapid rise of rural expenditures on food means that instead of the idea of supply chains being not just thinking about rural to urban, let alone rural to exports, now very substantial flows of food are occurring from between rural areas, rural to rural, and from urban to rural areas. For example, uh, with this a lot of processed food that's made in urban areas flooding into rural areas, as uh, I'll show in a second in terms of the share of consumption. If you look at this, these numbers, this also comes from a detailed analysis uh, of the LSMS data sets. We found that the share of processed food in total rural food expenditure in rural Asia is nearly 60%, 59%. And in urban Asia, 73%. Okay, so this has now become very high, and it's purchased. And this is based on averages of uh, what we did in detailed analysis of these data sets. Uh, and because of this rise of processed food, there's been a massive rise of small and medium enterprises in processing, as well as large processors. Uh, and of course, stockists that are in trading this processed food. And I would say that I could talk, talk more about this, but when we would do literature reviews for our various sectors, for example, rice, uh, we would find that there was a, a dearth, a scarcity of uh, studies on these processing sectors. You know, very few agricultural economics studies of these midstream, uh, mid, midstream segments. And then another big change that's occurring in the diets throughout Asia is a diversification beyond grains into vegetables and fruit and fish and meat and dairy and pulses. In Asia, about 65% again in value terms of total consumption of food is coming now from these non-grain sources and 75% is the share in urban areas. So, so it's fundamentally different from the 1980s. And of course what that means is there's been a rise also in these supply chains for perishables. Um, often people say, well there's no supply chains of perishables, but you know, you, and they're extremely underdeveloped, but that's impossible given that the volume of food that's uh, non-grains is enormous, okay, and the expenditure is actually the majority for these products. So the, these supply chains have grown enormously, but been understudied to a large extent. And the kinds of things that we're seeing coming up everywhere is rural packing plants and staging areas, secondary and primary city wholesale markets, semi-wholesalers that are operating between cities and rural areas, and, um, and uh, especially logistics firms that are extremely important but understudied. Now, if we think about that middle part of the train and the rise of food systems uh, in the midstream and uh, downstream, we've observed in our work in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and South Asia, two kinds of revolutions, quiet revolution and modern revolution. I'll come to that in a second. But let's just hearken back to what was the food system situation in the 1980s in Asia. And we can say that in general it was a traditional system, mainly focused on supplying to the village or the local town, so local. It was very fragmented, many hands in the supply chain. Uh, and there was a very small midstream segment, little processing, wholesale, and logistics. Food distribution in general, in agricultural economics, like in the general debate, was a niche subject, and often it was just to talk about what's going on in the public distribution system. Uh, and uh, also longer supply chains to urban markets were very much a niche subject back in the 1980s and even into the 1990s, and to some extent today. 
What we've seen from the 1990s through the 2010s is a cascade of three stages of food system change, from traditional to transitional to modern. Okay? And so essentially uh, what I'm, I'm going to call the transitional to modern, I'll call it the modern revolution, and the traditional to transitional, I'll call it the quiet revolution. Okay? Uh, quiet partly because uh, maybe since we've made a lot of uh, noise about the modern revolution and the studies of supermarkets, etc. Uh, there's a lot of attention focused on export markets and supermarket revolution, but really there's this gigantic quiet revolution from the point of view of the debate, but loud in terms of its actual presence of the shift from traditional to transitional. And uh, I'm going to, um, as I mentioned earlier, focus on the domestic market transformation partly because that's something like 90 to 95 percent of where agricultural output goes uh, from Asia, but also even in terms of consumption, only 90 percent of food in Asia is coming, I mean, 90 percent of food in Asia is coming from domestic supply, and only 10 percent is coming from imports. So, uh, as I mentioned, there's been a dual transformation of the midstream and downstream of the food system. Uh, the, and I would say, I'm just giving you, you know, rough estimates, is that the, the, the quiet revolution, which is the small and medium enterprise revolution going from traditional to transitional, might be one half to two thirds of the Asian food system. It might be for the next decade or two. Most of Southeast Asia, well along in South Asia. So this, this quiet revolution is a central piece that's been under-researched. Under uh, then I would say that the modern revolution with the rise of large processors and supermarkets might be about one quarter to one third of the total Asian food system, well along in Southeast Asia and emerging very fast in South Asia. Of course, in any given country and in the region in general, you have at any given moment an overlap of the different stages. For example, uh, the traditional stage, which might be waning, uh, it, it is waning in most of the countries, the tra transitional stage, which I think is now dominant, and the modern stage, which is beginning to emerge. So you have a mix in all of the countries. If we look at what's happened in the, uh, the modern stage, the modern revolution, this has been extremely fast. Uh, in, in India, it's especially been in the 2000s and 2010s that you've seen the rapid increase in supermarket sales, for example, and large processor sales. In China, it was approximately the 1990s and 2000s where it really emerged. So it's been abrupt and sudden, driven by urbanization, policy liberalization, foreign direct investment, domestic investments. And it's been a, really a story of continued concentration and partial multinationalization throughout Asia of the food industry and a symbiosis or a living together of the supermarket revolution with the rise of large-scale processors, modern wholesalers, and modern uh, logistics firms. So these have worked together and scratched each other's back essentially uh, to have a, a circle, a cycle of expansion. And as that expansion has occurred, they've more and more garnered economies of scale and scope and been out-competing uh, traditional players. And even, you know, this is very obvious in the case of processed food, in the case of even semi-processed food, but I've been very surprised by the rapid penetration of fresh produce uh, and uh, fish, etc., but especially fresh produce throughout Asia, where people would say, well, this is not traditional for us to have this change. Well, in fact, in the United States, in the first 40 years of supermarket rise, there was no uh, sales of fruit and vegetables from supermarkets uh, because our traditional food system was the daily visit to the wet market or the small shop or the or the um, the, the subsi walla that goes around and basically what I've been amazed by is the rapidity of the penetration of these traditional segments in Asia um, and something that's really surprised me I lived three years in China and I was even a, 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 an advisor for the Wholesale Market Association of China, and they, they were 
understanding these sorts of rapid changes that were going on and themselves trying to modernize the wholesale market system. For example, rolling out chains like fast food chains, but a chain of wholesale markets, et cetera, et cetera. So, sub, you know, su substantial change in that. And of course, uh, with the modern revolution has been a change in the conduct of the, of the food system with the rise of private standards, quality differentiation, procurement system modernization, um, and this has rolled out, of course, at different speeds, first in process sector, second in the semi-processed, and now it's emerging in the fresh segment. Now, I, I went more or less rapidly through the modern revolution because I think that's often discussed now uh, as, as work emerges on that. But very interesting is the quiet revolution that has also been extremely sudden and fast. As I'll tell a little bit, some of the changes, for example, the rise of cold storages in Agada are something that really occurred over a decade. It's not a long, slow process. And it's been fueled by domestic small-scale investments, again, off the radar stream of a lot of discussion, a grassroots revolution. This has been really a part of the urbanization driving longer supply chains and the proliferation of actors in these longer supply chains. Product diversification and value added uh, has also been driven by diet change. And with all of that, it's driven the proliferation of tens of thousands of small and medium enterprises in processing, wholesale, transport, warehousing, and cold storage. The importance of this is so extremely disproportionate to the very small amount that this has been treated in agricultural economics research. And some of the surprising things that we found in our, you know, we essentially have recently, in the past decade, introduced 15,000 actors in the supply chains in Asia. And uh, one of the things that really struck us, we heard very much about the importance of the tied output credit relationship, where an exploitative trader would advance money to a farmer and then at the end of the season be paid back uh, with an implicitly usurious interest rate extracted from that. When we went to doing thousands of farmers in different segments throughout the countries, including India, and we explored whether farmers had received such advances, we found that only 2% of the farmers had received advances from traders. That the, the, the myth of the extreme importance of the tied output credit markets had persisted uh, because there hadn't been, I think, sufficient tests of that hypothesis recently. Um, and, uh, you know, I went to a trader in Azadpur uh, to um, ask in the Mandi, you know, uh, what are we seeing here? We had heard that f traders were advancing funds to farmers and uh, now when we did our surveys we found that had disappeared. And the trader laughed at me. Uh, I've had a lot of traders laugh at me in my life. And he said, when are you talking about? Uh, is this my grandfather's time or is it my time? And in fact, he said that uh, in different words, that the rise of rural non-farm employment and roads and competition among traders made it so that if anybody gives an advance to any farmer now, it's mainly in a situation where it's a larger farmer that they're trying to tie down so and, and woo to be their supplier so that they reduce their transaction costs. It's a very interesting change that's occurred with the shift of the supply chains. And we've also found that even though people would constantly talk about very long supply chains with many, many actors stretched out along it, in our work we found, except for the hinterland areas, that there had been a shift away from these traditional rural brokers and more and more toward town-based wholesalers working with third-party logistics firms. We found that all over Asia, including in India. And of course, shifting from unpackaged bulk sale to package branded milled grains. That's happened faster in Southeast Asia and East Asia than South Asia so far, but I expect it in South Asia. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a rapid spread of technological change all along the supply chain, all along the supply chain, not just upstream. Here we have, of course, shifts in production from pastures to feed and capture to enclosure. But also in the other segments of the supply chain, you see massive changes all over Asia in transport, in milling, in packaging, in cooling. Okay, so what I want to do in uh, the, the last 10 minutes I have is give some what I think are extremely exciting uh, instances of confluences where 
a bunch of factors came together, which, which they called in manufacturing economics supermodularity, where any one factor might not change the situation very much, but when there's a confluence or combination of factors, it leads to hyper-rapid transformation. And I believe, as agricultural economists, it's, it behooves us not just to study the average situation or go to the hinterland to make sure to study that, but to go and find these uh, instances of very rapid transformation that are occurring and understand why that's occurring and how its effects are being diffused and uh, also uh, being replicated. And one example that we've done recently with IFPRI uh, and MSU is a study of fish farming in Bangladesh. And here again, very often, I won't repeat this very much, but very often the gurus in the policy circles or even research circles have a strong idea about what a situation is like and then we do these detailed kind of sweaty surveys and we find situations that's extremely different from what the, the hypotheses or the conventional wisdom were. In 1999 in Bangladesh there was a belief that fish prices would rise and choke food security, that there was essentially not going to be fish farming and that capture fisheries were starting to decline. There was woe. And what actually happened is from 1999 to 2018, fish prices dropped okay, in the country. And of course, as you know, in Bangladesh, the, the, the diet is rice and fish, or in another day it would be fish and rice. Okay, so it's, this is very important. And what we found is that in, 15, in 25 years, uh, the aquaculture sector grew 15-fold and it went from 30% to 70% of fish supply. And I know uh, uh, from P.K. Joshi that this is the situation that we see also in India. And in the case of Bangladesh, almost none of the fish from the fish farms or the fish capture is being exported. Bangladesh is not exporting those products, only a little bit of shrimp. So this is all driven by urban demand, these domestic market changes. And of course, because of the change in aquaculture, the, the feed sector grew 600% in 10 years. Extremely rapid change. Small and medium, we also did a, a fascinating, I think, meso inventory, looking at now, five years ago, and 10 years ago, by stratum, by zone, by uh, territory, how actors in the supply chain had changed in terms of their numbers. And we found that small and medium enterprises in the supply chain had also tripled in 10 years. And that was off the radar screen of the policy discussion. And of course there was a, a, a fundamental change in varieties from traditional varieties like carp to fast growing varieties like tilapia and catfish, something that's occurred all over uh, Asia. And these are just pictures of me in the, in the market, uh, in the feed mills, uh, in the feed mills, again a large mill near Dhaka, in the storage area of the large mill, in this differentiated feed products that are being sent out, and in the rapid increase in, in, in uh, small-scale equipment throughout the sector, uh, creating a lot of jobs. Now, closer to home, in fact, very close to the conference, another study that we did with IFPRI and MSU was in Agra. The Agra area, of course, is 25% of the potato market in India and one of the largest in the world. And uh, what we heard before we went out to do our survey was a lot of uh, statements from researchers as well as policymakers that unfortunately the cold storage sector is very underdeveloped, almost non-existent in potatoes as well as other products. Uh, but I think that the, throughout Asia and other regions of the world, uh, the sort of the habit that I formed is not believing what the conventional wisdom is and going out and doing these detailed surveys to test it. Sometimes confirming it, but very often being the opposite of what people thought was happening. We did an extensive survey in Agra and we found that in fact the situation that people thought was happening was happening in 1999, 10 years before the survey. 1% of the farmers used modern cold storages and 99% when they used storage which was only for 10% of their potatoes, was using traditional storage. But in the year that we did our survey, 2009, we found that in that 10 years, it had gone to 99% of the farmers were using modern storages. 
and only 1% were using traditional storages. Although there were still agricultural researchers working on improving traditional storage, it had disappeared. And 65% of the potatoes that were produced were being stored. Uh, so, and we actually did the same study in Bihar where we thought we would see none of this because it was even more traditional. But in fact, we found that the same uh, things were happening maybe just five years behind what was happening in Agra. You know, so this is just shifting from the traditional to the modern cold storages. And, you know, as we studied the reasons for this, we found it to be this cascade of factors. Uh, starting in the late 1980s and the early 1990s with farmers shifting in the Agada area from wheat to potato and the NARS rolling out new varieties of potato that were higher yield, more resistant to disease, but also longer storage life and more resistant to transport uh, so they could be stored. And of course there were public investment in water pump subsidies that we found almost only went to medium and larger farmers. Uh, and Yet all of this was encouraged by initial growth in Delhi. Uh, and to me, that was the big engine puller, because if you think of Delhi, I don't know, 15 or 20 million people, depending on how people are measuring it, and then certainly with Haryana and the areas around it, another whatever, 15 million, 20 million, uh, certainly you're looking at a population almost the size of France that's changing very quickly over 20 years and uh, incomes rising and roads links increasing. And so the diffusion of the urbanization effect was occurring through also improvements in, in, in rural roads, uh, not always perfect still, but rural roads, and diet diversification into horticultural products. The rise of demand for potatoes was also being transmitted as a signal out to rural areas from these giant urban demand situations. And the, uh, at the same time, you had a rise of the rural non-farm sector in the market shed around Delhi, which was driving up wages, which was fueling private investments in the supply chain. Many people told us they bought their truck that they used to transport the potatoes or their cold storage. At the same time, public investments were very important with public investment in the energy grid at the end of the 1990s. And there were limited subsidies for modern cold storages, which at the beginning people said were what was driving the change. But we found that only 5% of the cold storages in our study were financed by these limited subsidies. So it wasn't subsidies uh, that, were, that was driving this basic change. Instead, it was a massive private investment, especially by people in the towns in that area, as well as the farmers, in the mid to late 1990s, but then the crescendo came in the 2000s. And what we found by 2009, when we studied, is that the potato had gone from very seasonal consumption to year-round, and two-thirds of the potatoes in Delhi coming from cold storages. So this, so this is an example where a bunch of things came together and fundamentally shifted of the situation in a very short time. The final example that I want to give as I'm wrapping up the talk is that there's been fascinating changes that have been occurring upstream as well. Uh, for example, in Indonesia, China, and Myanmar, there's been agricultural services that are essentially outsourcing services that have been rolling out, and I know that is also occurring in India. Uh, for example, in Indonesia, sprayer trader mobile services that that uh, prune and uh, spray, harvest, and sell the, the mangoes for the farmers, or mobile combine services for rice farmers that we've seen come up very quickly recently in China and Myanmar. Here's a picture in Indonesia of the sprayer traders essentially sorting the product to take to market for the farmers, spraying high in the trees. So these are important capital assets that they have relative to the farmers, pruning high as well as skills. Then we saw a very massive new wave that actually rolled out in two or three years of combine teams in Myanmar, all over Myanmar, uh, in a situation where I, I also lived in Myanmar and they said there's not going to even be mechanization for 10 or 20 years and instead you'll see the numbers in a second. So the, there were teams that were also going around with combines uh, in Myanmar and you see the shift. This is uh, you know, essentially the liberalization that occurred and the, the pickup of the economy and you see in just a couple of years there was a massive increase in combines which were usually linked to these services as well as the threshers, pumps, 
tractors just suddenly rising. So that's another key element of my story is that these processes are not gradual often, they're extremely fast. And this is just a picture of the same kind of thing happening in China. So let me summarize, and I think I'm about at my ending time of 40 minutes. Uh, basically, what I've been trying to convey here is the immense power of and rapidity of the food system transformation pulled from downstream by urbanization and diet change, facilitated midstream by modern revolution, but also by a massive quiet revolution that's been largely off the radar screen, and then fed upstream by intensification and diversification and commercialization of uh, farming all around Asia, uh, and also the rise and development of input value chains and services, farming services value chains, that we think has been relatively understudied. This all together represents massive opportunities for farmers. The urban demand, the high value markets, this is a massive change. And it's not a small change, as I said, most of the diet now is in non-grains. But there's challenges this represents too. Obviously, both the modern revolution and even some of the quiet revolution mean rise of quality standards, safety standards, and all of this means there's demand for technology investment, not just by farmers, but actors all along the system. And with more integrated markets and systems, there's cost competition for any given zone from these integrated procurement systems. Uh, the impacts on farmers that we've studied, which I would go into more with more time, uh, is basically that uh, the upper one third, the elite of the small farmers and the medium farmers have become the main suppliers of the cities in India uh, and in other places. Often people say it's the smallest farmers that are feeding uh, India, free feeding their urban areas, but in fact we found most of these supply chains are the suppliers, the net marketers, are really the upper third of the small farmers and the medium farmers, not even the micro farmers. And our surveys found that the areas that were most benefited by all of this change have been those near the cities and towns and at an intermediate distance, while the remaining areas that are in the hinterlands have been largely left out of this because of transaction costs. Even in places um, that have put a lot of emphasis on rural roads, etc., like China. And we also found, though, where the, uh, the areas or the farmer groups that were benefiting from this have really made massive investments in their farm capital. Uh, and it hasn't come from credit. Actually, we found in all of the studies throughout all of Asia, including in India, that uh, credit played an extremely small role in all these changes. It's mainly from rural non-farm employment and from sales. Um, of course, the strategies of farmers I talk about in more depth, but uh, very few of the farmers are engaged in what often occupy a lot of discussion of uh, linking farmers to markets. The direct relations between corporates and farmers, I would say maybe includes 1% or half of 1% of the farmers in Asia. So this is an emerging thing and interesting to watch, but not the mainstay. Um, and sometimes there's relationships between farmers and uh, you know input providers and supermarkets and wholesalers that are very interesting where they're solving various kinds of asset and idiosyncratic market failures. But I think that really I want to leave you with the idea that uh, the, the, the basic actors in the system that are really running things are the traders and the processors. And because they were maligned or neglected in farm surveys, there's been relatively little research about these, and yet that, th those represent two-thirds of the entire value of the food system in Asia. And of course, it's interesting to see how they're interacting with uh, and what is the behavior and the performance of the emerging, sometimes the emerging role of new cooperatives or traditional cooperatives do uh, as a way of, of, of facing the challenges of the system. But I think it's very important to continue to do food system-wide studies that include all the actors in the system to be able to understand better these dynamics. Thank you very much.